Hi there, this is Robin Norgren and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find the work that I do over on Instagram. I have a link over there under at Robin underscore Norgren or at U B U the number four life. I'd like to start with some words from Taking Flight by Kelly Ray Roberts. Sometimes the creative life feels like a wild adventure, complete with the constant ebb and flow of bliss-filled moments, tangled up emotions, and an endless sea of questions. Often it's questions that take up an enormous amount of emotional space in our creative lives. Feeling slightly anxious, we may rush toward the answers thinking they'll bring peace and knowing. After all, our creative voice though instinctly, instinctively unique, is still attuned to the world we live in, a world of quick solutions, easy answers, fast-paced technology, and concrete explanations. Naturally, we seek instant answers, not realizing that perhaps the questions want to stay a while, get nurtured, and patiently stroll their way through toward resolution. The questions of our creative journey follow every move we make. They ask, what should I do next? Should I try teaching workshops? How about licensing? Or maybe they sound more vague like, what kind of artist am I? Do I want to continue along this path? How do I know if I'm even on the right path? If you're like me, you may be so involved in seeking the answers to these kinds of questions that you forget you don't necessarily need to know the answers today. Sometimes it's not in the knowing that we gain the most clarity. Just as Rilke suggests, we must try and live the questions inside our hearts, honor their existence, sit with them for a while, and nurture what it is they are trying to teach us. After all, there lies great mystery and potential inside the spaces of the very questions we sometimes rush to answer. Likewise, some of us avoid the questions altogether. We just follow our paths, perhaps feeling a bit uninspired. Yet we stay the course, keeping the status quo. This is when we really need to start having that conversation with our creative spirit and asking questions. Because questions, even without knowing the answers, expand our creative curiosity and potential for growth. So go ahead and ask the questions. By asking them in the first place, we may trigger or unearth a buried whisper, something we explored in chapter one. Asking questions like, what is it I really want to do? Or, How can I feel more saturated with joy in my creative life? These are wonderful ways to start engaging your creative spirit. From the Cloister Walk by Kathleen Norris. The modern guest who partakes of Benedictine hospitality soon discovers that it entails a remarkable freedom to be oneself. If you start to sing Ramon songs in a loud voice at three in the morning, chances are someone will ask you to quiet down. But then again, maybe not. The responsibility is yours. Rules and regulations are kept to a minimum. In fact, the customary of a monastery, a book that contains in written form the everyday customs and traditions of the place, reveals that Benedictines themselves live free from much written legislation. The customary is one of the largest monasteries in the world, is little more than a sketchy outline. One monk told me, this is because the minute you write something down, you set it in stone. And that's dangerous, because then someone will want to enforce it. 
Because they operate as families, Benedictines can claim a culture that is primarily oral rather than written, more dependent on lived experience and explicit codes of conduct. I once heard a monk who has doctorates in both canon and civil law explain that the Benedict has taken one of the strengths of Roman society, a passion for civil order, and had converted it into a legislation for a way of life that integrates prayer, work, and communality so flexibly that it is still relevant to 20th century needs. It may be more relevant now than ever. While Benedict respected the individual, he said, he recognized that the purpose of individual growth is to share with others. It was refreshing to hear a good legal mind with soul Another reminder of the monastic difference. We live in vigil, the monk said. Working at love is in common living. Monastic life is meant to be lived in vigil, in kononia, or a community of love. And it looks toward eternal life where love will be completed. I don't know many tough-minded lawyers who talk like this. Benedictines often remind me of poets, who, while they sometimes speak of the art of poetry in exalted terms, also know that little things count, that in fact there are no things so little as to be without significance in the making of a poem. Monastic life also requires paying attention to the nitty-gritty. We know that details matter, another monk once told me, and will tinker with our liturgy of the hours, trying a minute of silence after each psalm, after discovering that 90 seconds is too long. But we are still an experiment, after all these years, and we resist codifying. The great experiment of Christian monasticism is, has taken so many forms that it is hard to characterize. Now, as in the 4th century, monastic people live as hermits in loosely organized clusters of hermits, as members of cloistered communities, and in communities in constant contact with the world. They are urban, rural, and they live in wilderness. They work as pastors and as counselors, teachers, nurses, doctors, massage therapists, and they pray as, con as contemplatives. At times in the Middle Ages, monastic cities existed, inhabited by monks and their students, soldiers, and families of merchants, servants, farmers, artisans, a situation that several modern monasteries have emulated closely, taking in artists who practice their craft in exchange for room and board, or allowing widows, married couples, and families to participate more fully in the monastic life without making lifelong vows. Time will tell what works and what doesn't. After a millennium and a half, Benedictines can afford to take the long view. I was intrigued to discover that there are fussy monastic rules that predate that of Benedict, notably the rules of the master, in which fear and suspicion predominate, revealing an overwhelmingly negative view of both the world outside the monastery and the motives of individuals within it. Predictably, the author of this rule attempts, in the words of one commentary, to regulate everything in advance, to foresee every possible case. Benedict appears relaxed and humane by comparison, more laissez-faire, much more trusting of individual discretion. Whoever needs less should thank God and not be distressed, he writes, in the section about distribution of goods in the monastery. But he adds that whoever needs more should feel humble because of his weakness, not self-important because of the kindness shown him. In this way, all the members will be at peace. From the earliest days in the Egyptian desert, monastic life has attracted all classes of people. And this means, as Benedict was quick to realize, that equal treatment does not translate into equality. What is an unpleasantly hard bed for someone raised in wealth, might be a luxury to a shepherd used to sleeping on the ground. As recently in the 1930s, monastic novices raised on American farms, 
who had slept all their lives on straw-filled ticking, got their first experience of mattresses and sheets in the monastery. This cultural phenomenon by which monastic deprivation becomes a form of luxury is much in evidence today in the thriving Benedictine monasteries of the Third World, making Benedict's wisdom on the subject of need more relevant than ever. The ongoing Benedictine experiment demonstrates a remarkable ability to take individual differences in account while establishing the primacy of communal life. This comes from my journal titled, Deepen the Way You Live Your Life. Love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, leaps fences, penetrates walls to arrive at its destination, full of hope. Maya Angelou. The feeling of being loved. I love love. Love takes the edge off any decision I am making. Loving others. Being loved. What does feeling loved look like for you? How can you demonstrate more love to others? How can you invite more self-love into your life? <music> 